Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. We are going to be taking a look at Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody Number no. 2. It's one of his most well-known piano compositions. It's really tough and it's really fun. We've definitely been talking about Liszt a lot on this channel. Hopefully you're cool with that. I think there's a lot of Liszt fans out there, so hopefully we're good. We recently did a two-part series on the history of Liszt, so check that out if you missed it. We also talked about the easiest they're not easy, pieces by list as well. And in terms of analysis, we've done a previous analysis on Liszt Liebestrom video, or Liszt Liebestrom composition, so if you want more after this, definitely check that out as well. So what we are gonna do in today's video is we are gonna talk about the second Hungarian Rhapsody um, and different aspects surrounding it. So we're gonna talk about its history and its origins. We're gonna talk a little bit about Hungarian gypsy music, and then we're gonna discuss um, theory, nothing too heady, um, I want this to be approachable for music lovers who aren't, you know, particularly advanced in theory too. And yeah, and of course, as with every analysis video we do, there's going to be musical examples strewn throughout so you can actually hear the things that we're talking about. Without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> There are actually 19 Hungarian Rhapsodies in total, which were composed by Liszt between 1846 and 1853. Uh, there were a couple ones, uh, some of the later ones that were written in the 1880s, which was towards the end of Liszt's life, but they're all based on Hungarian folk tunes, or at the very least what Liszt assumed were Hungarian folk tunes. He wasn't always right on that account. Because even though he was Hungarian, he didn't live there for a good part of his life and he wasn't familiar with the language, so he kind of got it wrong in that sense. So yeah, he ended up making some assumptions about the music. A lot of the so-called Hungarian folk tunes were actually written by middle to upper class people, which were then incorporated by the gypsy musicians didn't originate with them. These rhapsodies are killer for piano players. They are among some of the most challenging repertoire there are for piano players because Liszt was a virtuoso, and sometimes he just likes showing off and doing crazy things on the piano. Liszt's original piano rhapsodies have also been translated to different mediums. Some have been arranged for orchestra by Franz Doppler, which Liszt also helped with and participated in. And Liszt himself also arranged some of the rhapsodies for piano duet and piano trio. However, in today's video, we're just going to be focusing on the solo piano version of the second Hungarian Rhapsody. And we're obviously not going to talk about all 19 rhapsodies, we're just going to be honing on, on the second Hungarian Rhapsody. So the very first thing I want to do with this video is show you the bold opening theme, which was noted by Liszt in 1846 as something he had heard. But we really don't know for sure if this is a fragment from a, like a Hungarian gypsy melody. We only know that he said it was. It could have been something he made up too. So let's take a really quick listen to the introduction so you can start getting this piece in your head. The work was composed in 1847 and published in 1851 when Liszt was about 40 years old. And even like basically right after he published it, it was a huge success. People loved it and it even ended up kind of annoying him because it became so popular. And this happens with musicians sometimes. They release something, it becomes a hit, and then they kind of get sick of it and they get sick of all the hype. And it got to the point where he wouldn't even let his own students play Hungarian Rhapsody 2 for him, probably because he just had heard it being butchered so many times. Let's talk about some gypsy folk music elements that Liszt incorporated into his Hungarian Rhapsodies. An element that he liked to use was the Hungarian Gypsy Scale. So basically the Hungarian Gypsy Scale is a harmonic minor scale, but uh, it has an extra augmented second in there and it basically just makes it sound like extra funky and extra harmonic with the, the fourth note being raised. This is also just kind of a fun fact. This is also a common scale in flamenco music. So aside from Liszt incorporating this funky scale into his rhapsodies, he also blended in other elements of gypsy music, like uh, its rhythmic spontaneity, we'll talk about that briefly, and an expressive, almost seductive quality. Another aspect of gypsy music were phrases that were rounded off with a type of melodic cadence, basically like a musical sentence under, like a period, known as a bakazo. If I mispronounce that, I'm really sorry. The melodic phrase end starts with the second 
scale degree, goes to the tonic, goes to the leading tone, and then goes back to the tonic. It's just kind of a way to, to close a phrase. So at the start of the lesson, which is the first section of this rhapsody, you'll notice that Liszt does this, uh, one of many times anyway, in the fifth and sixth measures. I'm going to show you a really brief audio clip just of this uh, beginning, the beginning of the last end, so you can get a sense of what that's going to sound like. Final note on gypsy music before we get into the thick of this, and that is the rhythm. So the second section of the verbuncos, uh, that would be just like the gypsy music genre, um, in Liszt's piece is marked with really fast running notes. And this is a really common theme of like any piece in this, uh, in the verbuncos genre. There also tends to be repetitive dotted rhythms like you see in the first section of Hungarian Rhapsody. And this is another common trend of the rhythm of gypsy music. Again, it's really worth mentioning that Liszt's understanding of Hungarian folk music was not deep, and he made a lot of assumptions with it. It's instead of being like an accurate snapshot in musical history and capturing the, the music of a people, it's more just his like, like a general spin-off with some stereotypes he made about the music. It's more of an accurate snapshot of Liszt and his writing style than it is of Hungarian folk music. This is a large scale piece and a full performance of it runs around 12 minutes long. So this large scale structure was heavily influenced by the Hungarian dance and music genre Ver Verbunkos, which we've been talking about. And this genre has several parts with different tempos. And another element found in this Hungarian Rhapsody are the two structural elements of a typical gypsy improvisation, which are the lassen and the friska. So the lassen is like the opening slow part, and then the friska is the second part, the, the like fast second half of the piece. And one thing that I think is kind of interesting is Liszt did some really neat harmonic symmetry in these sections because the lesson starts in a major key. It starts with a C sharp major chord, but then it quickly moves to C sharp minor, whereas the Frisca does literally the opposite. It starts briefly in F sharp minor and then quickly moves to a major key for the remainder. So we are, of course, going to start with the lesson because it's the first part and it's very serious and dramatic, which is in direct opposition to the Frisca, which is super fast fast and pure fun. So we're going to take a little quick listen to uh, a beginning of sort of the beginning of the last end so you can get a sense of its character. Um, you'll notice too that there's going to be modulation. I kind of marked in some of the harmonies here on the sheet music. Basically, if this doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. This is just kind of more of an advanced thing I wanted to show for people, but this is just kind of marking the chords. So the I chord would be representative of C sharp. Uh, because it's in the key of C-sharp minor, and so on and so on. So you can kind of see where it changes keys, and your ears might be able to pick up on it as well. The lively and playful Frisca section starts in the key of F sharp minor, but I think it's interesting, uh, Liszt doesn't start this on an F sharp minor chord, which is pretty a typical thing for composers to do. He instead starts on the dominant and just alternates back and forth between dominant tonic, dominant to tonic harmonies, which gives us this feeling of restlessness and uneasiness because we're constantly shifting from a tension note the dominant to a kind of like a safe and comfortable note, the, the tonic. Let's take a quick listen to this part. It's really haunting and you can tell just by the way it sounds that Liszt is slowly building us up to something bigger.
After the buildup, the volume starts to increase and we start to accelerate. Poco a poco, excel a crescendo. So poco a poco, accelerate and crescendo little by little. And we finally then arrive at the main theme in F sharp major. So it's at this point where Liszt really begins to pull out all the stops. He really lets loose. Our harmonies in this part are really simple. They're still alternating the tonic and the dominant, like the buildup part, but it's moving at lightning pace. enthusiasm continues on for a really long time and performing it is really tough it takes a lot of endurance and then we get to close to the ending before the epic big bold ending we have a cadenza ad lib to look at so basically what a cadenza is um, is an in improvisational passage it's usually very tough and the ad lib means the composer can kind of make up their own cadenza however a lot of performers aren't comfortable with making their own cadenzas and there's a couple really famous people who have written famous cadenzas for this including the playful one by mark andre hamelin Rachmaninoff did a cadenza and list himself also wrote some cadenzas but they're pretty much never performed i think just because they're crazy difficult so this is rachmaninoff's cadenza part of it anyway and you'll notice that it involves lots of jumping uh free-flowing fast notes glissandos and the one that i'm going to show you in the recording is different from this but it gives you an idea of what a cadenza is and what it could be in this hungarian rhapsody and i'm only going to show you a small snippet because the cadenza actually goes on for quite a while like it's a good minute or two so we'll just listen to several seconds The Rhapsody ends with huge fanfare and flourish in the key of F sharp major. It's written in prestissimo, which is very fast, and there are jumping octaves that span the entirety of the keyboard. This is how Liszt ended almost all of his rhapsodies, with fortissimos, wide octave leaps, trills, cadenzas, and other impossibly fast and complicated features. So let's take a listen. And that is all for this analysis on Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody. I highly encourage you to go check out Valentina Lisitsa's version. It's free on YouTube. It's a, like, it'll be a very good use of 12, 13 minutes of your life. Definitely go check that out and be amazed. Thank you to everyone who helps make these videos possible. Thank you for watching. Give it a like if you enjoy this type of video. Leave a comment if you have any suggestions for future videos along this line. Like if you have a specific composition that you really want me to take a look at, let me know. And I do always keep track of your requests. I have a ton of them, so I'm not going to get to everything, but I always read what you guys have to say and I really appreciate your comments. Okay, catch you in the next video. Video, video. So catch you in the next video. There, I can say it like a normal person. <laughs>